Hello everyone, Jason here with VC Edge. In this video, I'm gonna be showing you what I've been working on for the past several weeks, uh, maybe into the many weeks territory. It involves redesigning part of my knife and uh, working out all the issues with making the new parts for it. So I'm gonna run through what it is that I redesigned and why, and then I'll show you how I'm making the parts. So let's take a look at the bench. I'll show you what I'm talking about. So this is the handle scale that I'll be working on and the part that requires some redesign. This is a perfectly good design. It works just great and there's really nothing wrong with it except that uh, this style of lock bar embedded into a pocket in the handle and then fastened to it as a separate piece. That's, that's the style of lock bar. It's commonly known as a subframe lock. It has an existing patent on it already. And so I can't sell any of them like this. So uh, I've already had an idea to sort of redesign this anyway. And it just means that uh, this is the opportunity to go ahead and move forward with what I would have considered a version 2.0 and move forward with that design. The obvious choice would be to go with a, a full integral frame lock. And it looks something like this, where you have the lock bar and the frame or the scale all in one piece. And uh, that style of lock is very common. The problem with these types is that it's obviously very heavy because it's all one piece of titanium and you need it to be titanium on the lock bar so that it can bend at this pivot point. The other thing is that you end up having this rather large gap between the two pieces because you have to get an end mill or something in there to, to cut that slot. I wanna keep this overall shape. That was definitely one of the constraints and I want it to function the same way that it did and I want it to maintain its weight. Uh, that was the major challenge, of course. So how do I do that? Well, this is what I got. So here we have the new design. And as you can see, the lock bar is now part of the frame. By making a two piece handle scale, I was able to minimize the gap. It still has a little bit there just for clearance, but it maintains the overall look of the knife and its shape and function. At the same time, I deeply, deeply pocketed out all of the features on the inside of the titanium. Uh, enough to get the weight as close as I could to a fully solid composite piece. Now it is heavier than the equivalent amount of material on, on this style, but I'm also eliminating a couple fasteners, and so it ends up being very close. And to make up the difference, I just took out a little bit of the composite, and that did it. And it actually turns out I'm under the weight. One of the things that uh, helped me maintain the weight on this was uh, before on the lock bars, I had this uh, pocket here, but it was just basically a, a flat surface. Even though the outside isn't flat, the inside was uh, parallel to this flat surface here. And that makes it a lot easier to machine. You know, it's just a, a square pocket, more or less. And I wanted to make sure that I kept a consistent wall thickness across this whole thing. So I eventually figured out how to do that in the Fusion 360 modeling. And so these features under here, these are actually all three-dimensional, the same shape as what's on the outside. So that maintains a constant thickness throughout and uh, allows it to be more hollowed out than I otherwise would be able to get it if it was just uh, flat. Some of the early ones I had pocketed out all the way across, but uh, those ended up having a little bit too much flexibility uh, in this area. When you would put the knife together, you could uh, squish the two ends. All knives have a little bit of flexibility, but this side was flexing way more than the other side. So I had to add this little stiffening rib in there and uh, it only added a small amount of weight. So made up for that with the little cutout here anyway. Now I spent a substantial amount of time reworking the design and testing to make sure everything was gonna be right with this design. When I know this one worked, I needed to make sure. And uh, as you can see, 
it took quite a few attempts and, uh, and I made lots of changes to the design along the way. I uh, went from a sort of a dovetail shape and then moved on to more of a tongue and groove joint. And I think that looks a lot better. But uh, along the way, lots of little issues. Took a lot of time and a lot of effort to get it right. And so I hope you appreciate that. So let me walk you through the steps on uh, how I'm making this. It's definitely a little bit more involved than the original ones where you could just bolt the two pieces together, but it's a really nice result. So we're starting with just a, uh, a rough piece of 1 8 inch thick titanium. This is uh, eight inches long. And it's the same material that I was using to, to do the lock bars before, although now I don't get as much yield for sure. I can only do two out of this one piece, whereas before I could get about four of them in here. And it's overhanging on the edges, about an inch on each side, but it's not really a big problem. The amount of machining that goes on over here is really small. It's just a couple little tabs. I did square this material up though already on the edges to make sure it's all nice and flat along the edges so that it gets good contact all the way across. The features that get machined into this will transfer into a fixture where those parts will get located. So I'm unloading this tool tray right now. One thing I thought I should mention is that you gotta watch out for these sharp edges on this uh, tray, I guess, whatever it's called. On some of the edges on mine are a little bit sharp, so I'm trying to take care of that right now. I have a, a way of doing this where I put my thumb on here. I've got the tray in the tray load position, and I'll just sort of come in here and pluck it out, but I put my thumb on this edge, and I've actually cut my thumb uh, a couple times doing this without even realizing it, so going through each spot to make sure all these little uh, all these little corners are uh, sanded down. So keep that in mind if you're uh, plucking tools out of your tool changer the way that I'm doing it. So you can see that edge right there, how sharp it was before. I've just sanded the tips off of it, but yeah, that'll get you. So the machining for the insides of these parts will take about two hours to do these two parts. And uh, it's not the most exciting, it's just mostly a lot of material removal for those pockets. So I'll just show a few little clips of the machining and then we'll move on. It gets a little more interesting when we get to the outside features of the part. So I used the machine to cut most of the tabs off. So now all I have to do is cut this one tab off and the rest of them will just break away. There it is, just a little bit of uh, deburring to make sure this is all nice and flat and it'll be ready to go into the next operation. So this is my fixture pallet that I'll be using to do the outside operations on these parts. Uh, this is just a temporary one because I've been making changes to the design uh, so many times. I would just fill some of the areas that uh, needed changes and then remachine it so I don't have to make a new pallet for each time I make an engineering change. These parts just fit on nice and tight. And there's just a, a series of bolts that hold these down. Okay, just setting this up. Uh, it lines up with a couple of pin locations on the back. 
There's my pallet. That bolts down nice and easy. Uh, the one thing about this type is uh, it is sometimes a little bit hard to get off of here. Uh, on the next one that I do, the next stage of pallet for this, I'll put some little uh, handle grips underneath the bottom so that I can lift up. One of the things that I'm gonna be doing with this is with all the uh, the 3D tool paths uh, using the ball end mills, I'm actually gonna be tilting this to a 30 degree angle. Let me push this over. About like that, so that when the tool comes down, it'll be using more of the side of the ball instead of just the tip. It makes the tool last a lot longer and it gets better surface finishes. One of the things that happens with uh, contoured parts that have a shallow contour is that you can actually sort of see the, the steps in the Z. Uh, when it transitions over, it'll kind of leave a little step in the surface finish. So I didn't really like that very much, so tilting it over makes it so that it's more fluid. So it gets a lot better surface finish, the tools last longer, and uh, yeah, anytime you can do it with a ball end mill, you definitely should. And the way that it's set up, this is perfect for it. It's actually very easy to set up. Uh, I probably won't go through a full explanation on this video, but essentially you can probe the same locations that you normally would on the top surface uh, using a, a pin location, something like that, as long as you set it up in your cam so that that's the zero point, but you do have to have the zero point in the center of rotation on the, on the tombstone. So these are just some uh, undersized uh, stainless steel fasteners to put in those uh, counter sinks. So I stopped the program here to show you all something that I learned. Um, I'm about ready to do the final profile on most of this, except for right here where I still have this tab. I still need that to hold it down. Um, but getting ready to do the final profile, and I could do this after the machining is like mostly done and it's all almost finished. There would be a lot less material around the edges. Right now it's just been roughed in, so it's relatively thick. It still has this uh, nice large lip around the outside. If I wait till later, it will be thin enough that profiling the outside edge will cause lots of chatter, like what you can see right here. And uh, so I wanna try to avoid that. And the best way I know is to leave more material in the part. And uh, it seems to work pretty well so far. I'm gonna go ahead and change out this tool. I don't really like the way the finishes are looking here.
So I'm wanting to take this pallet off and uh, sometimes it can be very difficult to do so because both of the parts are very flat and there's a little bit of coolant residue in between there. So it can be really difficult to just pull this straight off. But uh, one of the things that you can do is take a little bit of air and aim it at the edge and that will lift it up. And then it comes right off. So sometimes that's a good way to take these things off. So something interesting happened with these parts. Uh, if you look at the size of these countersinks, they're a little bit large looking, especially if you compare it to one that I've done previously. And uh, yeah, those are way too deep. Those countersinks are just way, way too deep. Now what happened is that the, the countersink tool, the very tip of it broke. And at some point that I didn't even realize, and uh, I re-zeroed all the tool lengths with everything that was in the tool tray, and that was one of the tools that got re-zeroed. And with a broken tip, that means that it thinks that it's a little bit shorter than it actually is, and that causes deep countersinks. So these ones are uh, probably not any good. I'm gonna go ahead and make another set and uh, try to get that closer to the way I wanted it. All right, so here we go. We got the lock bar side of the handle all done. Uh, the edges are all finished up and deburred and everything. All the machining looks really good. And so now we've got to add the, the bolster side of the handle onto here. Now it could move this way and that way. It could move in and out. And that would be a big problem if it's off at all. Like the relationships between uh, this point and this pivot point and the backspacer locations are all really really important now on this part those are fixed so that's not a problem but from the pivot point if any of those are off it, uh, it, it makes the knife not work so uh, I need to have a fixture to uh, a cure a curing fixture for when we bond this together this is what I came up with it's real simple this is just a piece of aluminum it has a uh, it's machined down with some critical location points on it and I'm going to show you how it works so it has a couple of uh, locations that are going to essentially locate based on the countersinks that are here at the two spots and uh, and that's that's the way this is going to locate it doesn't use any of the internal features like the machining fixture does uh, but this is perfectly sufficient for this case so first thing that gets locked down okay so now that's in position and then i can take my other part and this is the initial fit check essentially before the bond preparation and i just got a pivot pin I can put that through. Everything's in position. I can just take a little clamp and use that to hold this down. Uh, otherwise, it all fits really well. It's nice and flush, and that's how this works. I, I also put in this little slot. That's right there at the bond point. And the reason I did that is because uh, if you were to just put this down on a flat surface and bond it together, the squeeze out that comes out of the, the back side of it would sort of fill up a lot of these areas in here so I don't want that to happen I just want it to have some, a little bit of squeeze out that I can sand off after the fact and not have to dig it out of the internal features of the parts the tape that's on here and this is a, a like a mylar tape or a flash breaker uh, it basically just uh, the adhesive doesn't stick to it I could just as easily wax the surface or something like that of the aluminum but the tape is easier to replace so the big problem with this fixture is that well, it's aluminum, and aluminum is subject to a lot of thermal expansion. So this width right here and this width here, are they need to stay constant during the cure cycle. So this fixture I can only do at room temperature, and, and really it needs to stay at pretty much the same temperature that it was machined at, which is uh, around 70 degrees or so. Um, if I put it in the oven at 180 degrees, this position from here to here would change dramatically. Uh, like you, if you cured it in that state and then took it off and then let this cool down, it would not fit back on. 
this works for now. Uh, it just takes a little time. And uh, the resin that I'm using takes about 24 hours to cure. The next evolution of this would definitely be to do one that is a, a full piece of carbon fiber, just a plate of carbon fiber that has all the same locating features. Uh, I'd have to bond in some little inserts so that I could thread them properly. And uh, it's a little bit more involved, but carbon fiber doesn't have the expansion rate like aluminum does. But this was a nice, quick, uh, easy way to do it and just to prove that this works. One of the things we need to do is to prep the surfaces for uh, this, uh, this bond. Now, you could just get in here with some sandpaper. It, it basically just needs to be scuffed up and clean. And uh, you could just get in here with some sandpaper and scuff it all up. That would probably work just fine. Same thing with this one. Uh, a little harder to get to some of the surfaces. But uh, there, there is a better way, and, or at least a much quicker way, and that would be to, uh, to sandblast the surfaces with uh, some aluminum oxide. That obviously is a little bit of a problem because we have a part that's basically finished and if we sandblast it, then it'll all turn to like a dull gray. Uh, I just want to blast the surface that's gonna be bonded together. To do that, I have some covers. And so this is a, a, a 3D printed material. It's uh, called TPU. And it's kind of like a, a semi-squishy like polyurethane that's uh, 3D printable. So I had my buddy Jimmy do these for me. So thanks Jimmy if you're watching. These are working really well. So this fits in like that. This one goes over the top of it. And so I can just take a little clamp and squish these two pieces together so that it seals up and there we go. Now I can sandblast it without having to worry about uh, hurting any of the other surface finishes. So, so I've got another one here for the composite part. Pretty much works the same way. Just covers up everything except for the area that I want to be prepped. that's done you can see the uh, the surfaces are still nice and shiny and the surface here where we're gonna be bonding is nice and dull so it uh, did its job and none of the other surfaces were uh, affected works great so I just got to finish prepping these parts uh, they've been reactivated by the sand uh, but I still need to finish cleaning them and and making sure they're all ready for bond. So I'll come back and we'll use this fixture to, uh, to bond them together. Okay, ready to bond these parts together. Just adding a little bit of the adhesive onto the surface. Doesn't take very much, just want enough on here so that it will get a, a little bit of squeeze out after it's been pushed together. The gap between the two parts is pretty small. And I put a little bit on each part. Probably don't really have to, but I like to make sure because they kind of slide together. I don't want there to be any uh, areas where the adhesive gets scraped off. Okay, so that's on there, secured in position, and then I just slide this one down into a spot. And I should be able to put this pin in, okay. Now that that's there, that's good to go. We've got some squeeze out on the top, and I don't know if you can see that, but there's a little bit of squeeze out on the bottom. So that's all good to go. Uh, the adhesive that I'm using is a uh, click bond adhesive. It's, uh, it's an aerospace 
Epoxy adhesive for uh, bonding metal and carbon fiber. It's one of the strongest ones. You got a decent amount of time to work with this stuff, even though it takes 24 hours to dry. You've got about 45 minutes to work with it in between, so that's kind of nice. So you'll notice that this whole outside surface is already finished, except now it's got a bunch of squeeze out on the outside, so I need to clean that off. To do that, I'll just use a little bit of isopropyl alcohol on a a uh, lint-free rag that has uh, just a light coating of it, not like fully saturated, because you don't really want the IPA to penetrate into the, into the surface. But just gently wipe that stuff off. Try to leave it with a clean surface. I do have two different styles of uh, handles. This one is a unidirectional carbon. It has a kind of a different look. It's more of like a wood grain sort of uh, effect that the handle has. So you know, some people like it. I, I like this one better, but uh, you know, this one's cool too. Yeah, just put my little clamps on and then uh, set this aside to dry. Uh, probably inside, some, in that, inside the house somewhere so that it stays at the right temperature. And uh, then after it's all done, we can finish it up. So in case anybody's wondering how strong that, uh, that bonded joint is, it's a pretty small surface area. Uh, well, the short answer is plenty, but I happen to have some articles here that are out of spec, so I thought it'd be fun to do a little destructive test on these and uh, just give a little demonstration on how strong that joint is. Uh, this is completely unscientific, but let's just uh, see what it takes. I'm just gonna put it in the vise here and See how much pressure it takes. All right, here we go. Let's see how much this bends before the, the bond breaks. <laughs> there you go. That uh, takes quite a bit of pressure. And that's in a, a bending motion. It's never gonna experience that, especially when the the blade is put together uh, with sandwiched with the other parts. It is plenty, plenty strong. So now that the cure time has passed, uh, I just pulled the pins and the fasteners out of it. It should be able to just come right off. You can see I've got a little bit of squeeze out there. All I have to do is uh, take this to a flat surface with some sandpaper and sand that right off. Ends up looking something like this, nice and clean, set and finishes on the outside. And there's our completed handle with the new integral lock bar. I think it looks pretty awesome. I guess the last thing to do would be to show you a knife with one of these all assembled. So here's one that I've been carrying for a little bit. This is uh, number 17 I'm using as my test article. And it's all working really, really well. It is super smooth. Has the nice, the same sound that it used to. So none of the really important things have changed. Lockup is still good. Yeah, one of the other things that I did change uh, was with the pocket clip. I made this slightly wider and slightly shorter so that it lined up with some of the some of the features of the new handle and lock bar setup. For the other side of the handle, since I was on a weight reduction kick anyway, I decided to go ahead and mill out some of the carbon on this because it's really not necessary for it to be a, a, a solid piece. So I can take some weight out even more uh, for basically for free. Uh, just milled out some of that material. That got me to an eventual weight for the entire knife of 1.75 ounces versus the 1.8 ounces that it was before. I mean, it was already super light, but hey, I can, I can go even further, so why not? So that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed that. If you have any questions or comments, just put those down below. And also subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. If you'd like to be notified for when knives are available, the best thing to do is to go to my website. That's vcedgeknives.com. There's a link down in the description. And just sign up for the email notifications and you'll get an email when knives are up for sale. Hope you all have a good day. See you on the next video.